Great, thanks, Nick, and, and welcome everyone. Really pleased to introduce our, our speaker for today, Dr. Mark Lantain, who is an Associate Professor of Political Science at UIT, which is the Arctic University of Norway in Tromsø, where several of us will be heading at least uh, you know, over the weekend for Arctic Frontiers next week. He specializes in Chinese and East Asian politics and international relations, as well as Asia Pacific security and cooperation. He also specializes in the politics and security of the polar regions, including, and what many of them know, us know him for, a Chinese and East Asian diplomacy in the Arctic and via the Antarctic Treaty System. He is the author of several books, including China and International Institutions, Alternate Paths to Global Power, as well as Chinese Foreign Policy. And there's been several editions of, of that at this point, right, Mark? Uh, also, he's co-editor of the Rutledge Handbook of Arctic Security, book on Nordic China diplomacy, and many articles on Chinese domestic and international politics, including lots on polar diplomacy. He is also chief editor of the Arctic News blog, Over the Circle, which I think several of us read on a regular basis and is certainly regularly quoted in international news services as well as government publications. His current research includes work on the politics of non-Arctic states, including China, Estonia, Japan, Singapore, and Switzerland within the Arctic policy sphere. Mark, great to have you here virtually connecting, and floor is certainly yours. We look forward to it. Hey. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you, Nicholas. And thank you, everyone. Um, yes, we are very much going to be hosting uh, quite the event next week. It is the Arctic Frontiers, and it's going to be inter an interesting conference this time around because it used to be that um, the conference usually tended to focus a little bit more about uh, science, about business, about Arctic development. And this time around, we're definitely seeing a discussion about security. And as you might imagine, uh, Russia is taking much of the talking points, at least in the hallways. But for the purposes of this session, although I'm happy to talk about Russia as well, I wanted to talk a little bit about where China fits into the Arctic mosaic. Now, <laughs> There's been a lot of discussion about what China wants in the Arctic, and some of it tends to almost run away with the story to suggest that China is a revisionist actor in the region, that it has some kind of a grand design for its security interests there. But I want to take a little bit, I want to take that apart a bit and to discuss uh, not only what China's doing in the Arctic, but also what its limitations are. Now, first and foremost, it's really necessary to contemplate China as a newcomer to the Arctic. Uh, it has not had, certainly not compared to Arctic states, certainly not compared to many non-Arctic states, such as uh, those in Europe and even in other parts of East Asia. China's had a very small amount of time to really understand the Arctic as a region, to understand not only its geography, its climate, but also its peoples, its uh, economy, and its political interests. And much of China's diplomacy in the region has been based on just that, just getting the data necessary to engage the region successfully. So that has to be kept in mind right from the beginning. And by the same token, it is still trying to define what its interests are. Like, what does China really want from the region other to, than to be accepted as a necessary player? Now, China has been trying to put forward the idea, the identity that it is an indispensable partner, or to use the Canadian term, a helpful fixer. That with the Arctic undergoing rapid change, I certainly don't need to go into that. We see evidence of this pretty much everywhere we look, that it is the understanding that we really need international actors uh, from all around the world to really understand what is happening on the climate change front. China has been over the past few uh, decades, and this is something that I've been following in some of my discourse analysis, uh, has been very interested in trying to determine, okay, how is the Arctic affecting China in regards to its climate, its pollution, um, its temperatures? And there's been some very interesting papers that have been put forward um, talking about how the Arctic, for example, changed snowfall in Siberia, affects pollution and wind in Northern China. Uh, cold temperatures, warmer temperatures, and flooding. So I would say science diplomacy is still a major part of what China wants from the region. It's understanding, though, that it's, uh, the Arctic is uh, changing to the point where it's really starting to affect many parts of the world outside of the Arctic, including China itself. So that has been kind of China's major focus, the idea that we are a 
a uh, very important part of the international discourse about changes in the Arctic. And when I first started looking at this issue about 10 years ago, there was quite a bit of optimism on China's side, talking to Chinese researchers and policymakers, saying that, okay, we are getting the knowledge we need, we are engaging with all of the Arctic states, not just Russia, and it's only a matter of time before we're really accepted as a necessary actor. And of course, this was the time where China became a formal observer in the Arctic Council, which caused a bit of a stir here and there, but it was really a major jolt to China's Arctic interests. Fast forward to today, and things have changed, to put it politely. First of all, China's hopes that it would be able to kind of float above the changed political and security situation in the Arctic hasn't happened. China has really gotten a rather nasty wake-up call that trying to disconnect its own policies from the Arctic strategic situation is simply not going to happen. And secondly, China itself is undergoing quite a bit of change, and unfortunately not in the right directions, in my view. We are seeing China become much more closed, much more nervous about engagement with the West, and that is really starting to bleed into a lot of China's Arctic diplomacy. Used to be when I first started doing serious Arctic research in Shanghai, in Dalian, in Beijing, uh, it was very easy to get in touch with Chinese researchers and to compare notes and to suggest, okay, what are the ways that non-Arctic states like China can engage the region? These kinds of contacts, though, are becoming much more difficult. There are a lot more concerns about uh, Chinese researchers having contacts with Western scholars. We're definitely seeing changes. If you go to any major Arctic event, uh, any track two, Arctic frontiers, Arctic circle, you definitely see a change situation in not only the number of Chinese representatives, it's for the most part gone down, but also the tendency, and this definitely came up at the last Arctic Circle conference, of researchers um, pretty much towing the party line to talk about China as a very definitive Arctic actor without straying too much from script. So we get back to the original question. So what does China really want in the region? And why is the original plans of five, 10 years ago not coming to fruition? We go back to science diplomacy. Now, there is a lot of discussion about science diplomacy in Tromsø right now because our university used to have very robust contacts with um, counterparts in Russia, think tanks and universities. None of those have been maintained under current circumstances. And now there's the discussion about, okay, how long can the situation last? Because we wanna talk about climate change. We wanna talk about glaciology and climatology and biology. We're not interested in the politics. Is there any way to separate um, the political situation from the science? This argument is difficult, not only in the Russia sense, but in the China sense, because we're seeing more evidence that although China is still wanting to learn from other Arctic scholars about the region, concerns about, OK, where is that data going? What is it going to be used for? Is that much more prevalent? So China has open research stations. There's been uh, one in uh, northern Iceland, and I had the opportunity back in June to visit uh, China's research base in Ialesund in Svalbard. It wasn't occupied at the time, but it was great to finally see it after researching it for so long. And China had hopes of setting up uh, research stations in Canada, in Greenland, but none of those have really come about. And I think it's unlikely that will happen. Icebreakers have also started to become a little bit of a political football. China had two uh, icebreakers operational, the Snow Dragon and the creatively named Snow Dragon 2. A third icebreaker just uh, started official launch and sea trials, the Jida, the Polar. And a fourth one is apparently on the books. And there's still some discussion about whether China might actually build a nuclear engine icebreaker, although that's been kind of on the books for a while. So China wants to enhance its Arctic and its Antarctic missions. But the discussion now is, well, that's all very good, but where is that data going? What are the potential strategic aims of this data? And we've seen other examples. There was quite a stir um, about half a year ago when all kinds of sensor sy systems were being set up by China in the Arctic, nominally to just measure the ocean currents and local environment, but the worry that this could also be used to track submarines. And of course, we got to talk about the balloons. Yeah, those balloons that were sent up to track weather patterns and certainly caused uh, some problems in the US and Canada. So the dual use question is now really starting to haunt any suggestion about uh, China's science diplomacy. And 
with the problem of how it is possible now to engage in serious bilateral research with Chinese researchers under these conditions, it's starting to become much more of a problem, especially with China putting forward new laws regarding uh, use of data and potential collaboration with foreign forces. So let's talk about economics. Well, China is still very much interested in helping to develop the Arctic. It sees itself as a natural partner for all kinds of different Arctic uh, projects relating to shipping, extractive industries, infrastructure, trade, and all of that. And we have still China quite dedicated to making sure that its economic interests in the region um, are still able to grow. Things have changed there as well. You have so much discussion back in 2017-18 about the growth of the Polar Silk Road. This was going to be the northern tier of the Belt and Road Project, which recently had its um, 10th anniversary, that this was going to be a new shipping route which would allow for fast shipping between Europe and Asia and potentially even on to North America. Things first ran into trouble during COVID, understandable, but then things ran into trouble as soon as Russia invaded Ukraine. China was put in a very awkward situation. Uh, the Chinese government was told no uncertain terms by the United States that any aid and comfort to Russia would be considered worthy of sanctions that any attempt to kind of break uh, Russia sanctions would put forward a response. And for the most part, China believed it. And China has been very, very careful in its economic dealings with Russia, including in Siberia, to walk right up to the red line without stepping over. Oil and gas, great. If anything, China has increased its oil and gas purchases from Russia at a very uh, discounted price, because certainly Russia is not able to sell its fossil fuel in Europe. Uh, discussions about um, future economic cooperation, potential development, a lot of talk, not very much in the way of action. And the number of ships, Chinese ships, that have used the Northern Sea Route uh, has gone down quite a bit since 2022. However, <laughs> although Costco, which is China's major shipping firm, has certainly stepped back from any kind of serious Siberian shipping, uh, a new company, very creatively referred to as New New Shipping, <laughs> has stepped into the breach. Its origins are very, very murky. And one of their vessels, the New New Polar Bear, got itself into a little bit of trouble a few months ago when it was implicated in some cable cutting. So again, China's been trying to separate its economic interests from its strategic interests and running into quite a bit of trouble. The frustration in some companies in China is starting to become a little bit palpable. Um, just yesterday, the uh, CEO of uh, the um, CNUC, China National Offshore Oil uh, Corporation, made a statement criticizing the sanctions on Russia. So again, there's the idea that we walk up to the red line, but we do not cross it. We do not look like we are op openly providing economic support for Russia in key areas. But it's pretty apparent that China is simply waiting for the situation to ease off a bit before once again increasing its economic presence. It's just a question of wait, waiting as far as uh, Beijing is concerned. And what's happening with Arctic sea routes right now? Like five years ago, seven years ago, everyone was talking about this new frontier of Arctic shipping, that China would be right at the forefront of all kinds of expansion of maritime shipping in the Arctic. Uh, one of my colleagues wrote a very interesting study about, uh, Mia Bennett wrote a very interesting piece about how the Central Arctic uh, China had its sights on, and that it was just a question of when is it going to be safe to send a ship through the Northern Arctic um, over the North Pole, and China would be there. So what has happened since? Well, in addition to COVID, in addition to concerns about ties with Russia, uh, China's economy has kind of gotten in the way. China is experiencing economic downturns to the point where I haven't seen in a long time. Like the best comparison would be some of the inflation crises in the 90s, but even that uh, is paling compared to what is happening now. We are seeing an economic slowdown. We are seeing rises in unemployment. We are seeing a lot of concern about real estate, banking, and many foreign firms are now starting to get very concerned about any kind of investment under current circumstances. So even though China kind of had the reputation, especially via its Belt and Road, of being just an unlimited ATM, reality is starting to kick in quite a bit. And with China's 
in my view, very haphazard attempt to declare neutrality over the Russian conflict in Ukraine. I think that has cost China further uh, economic legitimacy, certainly around here in Europe, but I would say in North America as well. That said, I don't think it is fair to say that China is going to be removing itself from the region anytime soon. China still is in great need of Arctic resources. There is still a lot of interest, for example, in offshore oil uh, in other parts of the Arctic. There is certainly a lot of interest. China still needs access to cheap fuel, cheap natural gas. And certainly, China still wants to engage other Arctic states beyond Russia to really make the Polar Silk Road uh, exist throughout the region. And one issue related, which is starting to appear, is strategic materials. Now, China has been very good at locking down access to these kinds of materials. So I'm talking about rare earths, lithium, nickel. But certainly the Arctic, and we're having discussions about Greenland uh, next week, uh, its riches are certainly not something that China is ignoring. China might have had some mining plans which didn't go through, but I think it's a little premature to say that China is not interested in Greenland anymore. And then finally, we have the issue of governance. And I think this is an area where China is still trying to find its footing. So I mentioned in 2013, China becomes a formal observer in the Arctic Council. And China's made it very, had made it very apparent that it was very happy with this arrangement, that it had no quarrels with the Arctic Council, that it was very interested in engaging Arctic states in other areas, was a adherent to the Polar Code, was very interested in signing on to the Central Arctic Fishing Ban. And it really tried to put forward the idea that we are a joiner. We want to be a helper. We are not a revisionist state in the region. But a lot has happened in the Arctic Council over the past uh, year and a half. The Arctic Council went on pause, if you want to call it that. The situation now is that Russia is being re-engaged, but only on a very controlled fashion. Any political dialogue is still a no-go within the Arctic Council. And this caused a little bit of concern in China. Gao Feng, China's de facto Arctic ambassador, made reference at the Arctic Circle, not last year, but the previous year, that it would be very difficult for China to continue to engage the Arctic Council with Russia not there. Because you take out Russia, you don't have the Arctic Council, you have something else. And that caused a lot of media consternation. It's like, oh no, China's about to leave the Arctic Council, help. But what it really demonstrated was that China certainly wants the Arctic Council to continue, that it's certainly not wishing for its dissolution. But as far back as almost 10 years ago, Chinese officials were saying, we only consider the Arctic Council to be part of a larger puzzle when it comes to governance, that we want a multi-tier approach to the Arctic, which would allow for non-Arctic states a greater say. And one question which I was asking when I was in Ottawa and other parts of the Arctic was, what is going to happen when China gets to the point where it has invested heavily in the Arctic? That process may have slowed down, but it hasn't stopped. Is China going to be happy being an observer, along with Italy and Switzerland and other countries up in the bleachers? Or is it going to demand other uh, forms of uh, other forms of say in the region? And my argument is that, yes, it is only a matter of time before China is going to say, look, I would like more representation. And with the Arctic Council and the situation that it's in right now, China is starting to very quietly test the idea of, well, something else maybe. The BRICS, which recently expanded to include some other countries that are not exactly in the I Love US Club. We have China being asked by Russia, along with other BRIC states, how about we set up a research station in Svalbard for the BRICS? And that was all over the Norwegian news here. And there was all kinds of debate over, OK, is Russia serious? What does this mean? Because Svalbard, to put it politely, is quite a touchy subject up here in northern Norway. But I can talk about that a bit later on. And there's also been some discussion about the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, perhaps playing a greater role in the Arctic. And China's basically saying, look, you, the Arctic Council, are not the only game in town. We have options. And even if we don't decide to exercise those other choices, we are still going to be in the Arctic and we are not going anywhere. 
And what has been fascinating, and I've been working with Whitney and others on this subject, is that China is starting to create its own narrative about what is happening in the Arctic. We were discussing back um, at a conference in Reykjavik a short time ago about how China has been taking the idea of Arctic exceptionalism and kind of turning it on its head. You see comments, including in Chinese journals and in Chinese media, that the Arctic used to be a very peaceful place, a very calm place where everything was predictable and you had polar bears dancing. And then the US with NATO came along and wrecked it. Why? Because it wanted to contain Russia, that it wanted to continue to expand its influence in many parts of the world as possible. I've lost track of the number of political cartoons in Chinese papers that portray NATO as an octopus, just kind of ex expanding everywhere. And the other point that uh, China is making is that it is really the U.S. that is the spoiler in the Arctic, not Russia. That it was the U.S. that was solely responsible for pushing, like actually saying pushing, Sweden and Finland into NATO as a way of maintaining U.S. hegemony. There's been a lot of concern that the closer uh, military relationship between the US and Norway is going to work its way to Svalbard. China has accused Norway, by the way, of kind of bending the Svalbard Treaty and not allowing China to research what it wants. So there's a little bit of pressure there. But also that with a lot of Arctic governance becoming so uncertain, China is now, the Chinese government is very much of the view that we need to make sure that we are not lost in all of this chaos that might be coming, that we still want to walk a balance between supporting Russia, talking about scientific cooperation with Russia, while still being an Arctic state, while still being, sorry, a near Arctic state, one which uh, certainly wants to engage the entire region. So this is the conundrum that China has right now. It really entered the Arctic seriously about 15 years ago, expecting a very calm, very measured, very uh, open process of engagement. And pretty much every aspect of what China wanted in the region has either gone out the window or has become extremely complicated. So what happens next? There has been quite a bit of talk, and certainly China and Russia are not necessarily discouraging this, about some kind of greater cooperation between China and Russia in the region. Um, some have even speculated about an Arctic alliance, and I think that's way too premature. But I would certainly say that with China's Arctic partnerships, including, for example, with Canada, with Sweden, with Denmark, um, certainly with the US becoming a lot more fraught, uh, Russia is certainly uh, taking a greater role in what China wants in the far north. I don't think, though, that this will lead to an alliance. I still think that we are, or even a closer partnership, because yes, they do talk the talk. But if you're going to be engaged in that level of cooperation, you need trust. And the fact is, we are not seeing a lot of signs that beyond the surface, beyond the cocktail parties and the talk about a no limits partnership, that there's a lot of trust that China has over Russia's uh, Arctic policy and vice versa. So if anything, Beijing is suddenly realizing that, yikes, we're more alone here than we hoped. We were really hoping to be nicely embedded within a larger mosaic of Arctic partnerships, and we don't have that. So will China pull back and wait? I think that's very likely. Will China continue to move closer to Russia? I think that's likely, at least on a surface level. But I definitely think we can say that China is finding it very difficult to continue to maintain the persona, the identity of being an Arctic, uh, being an Arctic player and a positive Arctic actor. Things have become much more complicated for Beijing now. So I'll leave it here and very happy to take questions on this. Thank you very much.